Hey, did you know that you can use the command spell to get a powerful greatsword early in the game? No, not that one. This greater sword. Keep watching for that and much more. Now, there are already a ton of videos about powerful builds, basic tips like using stealth to start fights, or blowing everything up with explosive barrels. So, the point of this video is to help with specific fights that I've heard people sometimes lose their honor mode run on, as well as to show a few other tricks and secrets that you might not know. And if you think honor mode is already easy, then just use these tips for your next solo run. Note that all of these were recorded on Patch 5 from December 2023, in case anything gets patched out in the future. With that said, let's get going. Believe it or not, many people say they lose their honor run at the very first fight in the game against the brains on the beach. To be fair, it's just you and Shadowheart. If you're playing as Shadowheart, or as a Gith Yankee that doesn't want to hang out with that racist, it may be a bit more challenging. So, just avoid that fight for now by jumping up here. Grab this hidden chest as a bonus and then continue up. You can make these jumps even with only 8 strength. Then you can make a couple friends and take on the brains together. You can even sneak in through here to get the drop on them and make it really easy. While you're in the area, hop down here to find a rock with a hidden harper chest under it. You'll need at least 11 strength to move the rock, but it's got some useful potions as well as a note that will lead you to another useful item up here. Hop on up and grab this very convenient pendant that will allow anyone in the party to cast Guidance. You're off the hook, Shadowheart. Walk by a buried chest, but you fail the survival check? Just use your shovel to dig it up anyway. You don't even need to hit the exact spot, it's pretty lenient. The skeleton fight in the crypt isn't too difficult, but you can make it easier by looting all of their weapons, and starting the fight by trying to pick one up. Not enough? Okay, you can actually pick the skeletons up and move them, not by throwing them, but by using improvised melee weapon. After selecting the action, you can carry them quite a distance before you'll stop and toss them, but that'll start the fight. Instead, before you reach the spot you clicked, Press your Cancel Action hotkey, and you'll immediately drop the skeleton without alerting them. You can do this as many times as you want, with all five skeletons. Make the fight really easy by dropping them in a pile, or, if you want to get really stupid, you can do something like this. There are several cutscenes that can be triggered just by long resting very early in the game. One of them even requires you to rest before the fight outside the Druid Grove. Go to hell. If you long rest enough times, you can even trigger Astarian's vampire reveal. <laughs> just partial rest as many times as you want without using any supplies. Speaking of Astarian, the happy buff he gets from feeding is quite strong, especially early on. But letting him feed on you leaves you with the bloodless debuff. An easy way to remove the debuff is with the Amulet of Sylvanas that lets you cast Lesser Restoration once a day. You can find it under this rock, down here past Volo and his bear friend. Oh, and while you're talking to Volo, be sure to buy this ring of his. If you let Aradin knock out Zevlor, you can easily pickpocket his snazzy gloves without him noticing. The Harpy fight is another one people can have trouble with. To make it a bit easier, you can cast one of the most useful spells in the game. Silence! If you place it here before you talk to Merkin, it will prevent any party members from getting lured before they can even take a turn. The harpies can still fly out of the silence area to start singing again, but it's not as bad once you've had a chance to pick some off. Past the harpies, not only is there a chest here with a bit of gold, there's a nest way back here with a few more goodies. You will need 10 strength or a bit of help to make the jump, though. Once you have access to the Thiefling hideout, you can use this odd trick to get your hands on the Shapeshifter's Boon Ring without killing the strange ox. Stash your party in the hideout, then send one person back out, and shoot the ox with something that won't kill it. Then escape back down the hatch. 
When you return, you won't be in combat. The ox will be none too pleased with you, though, and will expect some gold to smooth things over. Instead, just switch to trade and buy the ring. Combined with the sky's self, this ring is great for helping pass all sorts of checks, from conversations to pickpocketing. If you want to recruit Karlak early, just go to Zevlor's room and climb up here and go outside. Keep climbing, snag this chest, and then use Featherfall to jump straight to Karlak Town. And if you don't have the Featherfall spell handy, you can always use the potion in the Digital Deluxe chest. And while you're down here, don't miss this ring that you could easily make use of for the rest of the game when it's time for picking locks and picking pockets. Just remember to unequip it when you don't need it if you're using it on your main character or a charisma-based caster. If you use a soul coin, it will provide the 1d4 fire damage on melee weapon attacks while raging, just like it says in the tooltip. However, it will always give fire damage on unarmed attacks, regardless of your current health. And not just once, but twice for some reason. This makes soul coins exceptionally powerful if you respect Karlak into a monk. Most people already know that you can talk your way into the Blighted Village as a drow, or disguised as a drow. Don't pick that third option, by the way, or the goblins will attack. But you can also sneak into the village by climbing the vines back here, allowing you to ambush the ambushers. And while you're here, you can hop into the Underdark right now if you want. Just climb down the well, grab these boots for later, use turn-based mode to sneak past the Edder Cap, cast Featherfall, and take a leap. Once you're down here, just walk around to the Salunite Outpost, activate the waypoint, and group up with your pals. Did you fail the perception check on this hidden door? Just use the Enhanced Leap spell and stand right in this position. Wiggle the mouse around a bit until you find the right spot, where you can jump up and plunder the chest. Nice try, Saloon. From there, you can pick up Falara Louvre, as well as find Blurg and buy some They are coming. You are coming. Uh, sorry, uh, where was I? Uh, right, the Underdark, okay. Other attractions include Boal's Hangout, the Festering Cove. Who? Where? Near the dead drow next to the entrance to the Arcane Tower area, there's a hidden ledge you can jump down to. Watch out for the torch stalk, and don't miss this tasty helmet before you climb down into the cove. There are a number of hidden chests around this area, but the important thing is Boal himself. This guy. If you sacrifice a party member, they'll be dead dead, so don't try it on Gale. But you'll get this powerful buff permanently for the other three members of your current party, as well as a boatload of XP. Okay, yeah, you can also get the XP without the buff by just convincing the fish that Boal ain't so special and killing him instead. If you want to avoid fighting all the fish, you'll need to pass some combination of checks during the conversation most of which will lead to this choice that will let you fight against just Boal, which ain't too difficult. While you're in the Arcane Tower, don't miss out on this strength-buffing club, or these Featherfall boots. For the last of the important business in the Underdark, let's deal with the Spectator. Hide the party back here, then send one person to toss something at our stoned friend down there to trigger the cutscene. Sure, it looks like you're walking around the statues, but you're still safely in the outpost. You still start out surprised, but as long as you get out of the way of the spectator's long vision cone, you'll be fine. Wait until it's looking away from you, then enter turn-based mode and hit it with a ranged attack to start the fight. And now it's surprised. So, you can sneak the rest of your party in, and everyone will get two turns before the spectator even gets a chance to fight back. As for Dorn, well, you really only need his items, so you can just smash him to bits. Or you can use an Oil of the Basilisk on him if you really want to have a chat. Okay, time to get that greatsword from Joaquin's Rest. While Yeva is pushing on the door, she won't aggro if you cast Command Drop on her. So you can fail and then just try again until she drops her weapon. 
But if you succeed at the command cast from too close to Tristan or to Yeva herself, they'll actually pick up the sword and pocket it. If Tristan picks it up, you can try to pickpocket him for one last chance at getting the sword. The better plan is to stand back here, close to Fist to recruit Ephron, before casting command. She'll still give you the stink eye for succeeding at the spell, but she won't pick up the sword. Don't grab the sword yet, or you'll get caught red-handed. Instead, simply rescue Floric as usual, choose a reward, and wait for everyone to leave. Then grab the sword off the ground, and no one is the wiser. Take note that once you enter this area, even just sending the party to camp will advance time at Joaquin's rest, causing most of the NPCs to leave and take their swords with them. However, you can toggle group mode and send a single character back to camp without triggering the time skip. This allows you to respect a character into a cleric if you showed up without one, or to respect your cleric into a cleric to refresh your spell slots and keep casting command, in case you get really unlucky. And why is this sword so great? It gives you a huge boost to hit chance, at this early part of the game when just landing your single attack per round is the most important thing. It also synergizes really well with Great Weapon Master. Another spot that gives people trouble is the f wait what? You're telling me that you can use command to get an even greater sword? Okay yes, you can, but you only get one shot at it, the chance of success is low, and doing this screws with Lazel's personal quest progression, as well as causing other… issues. I wouldn't recommend it. While we're on the subject of that Githyanki patrol, there's a misconception that Lazel has to pass the deception check during the encounter to resolve it peacefully. Actually, the party leader is the one that makes all the skill checks, even if you're controlling a companion character when you start the conversation. Cast any bonuses to charisma checks on your party leader that you can, particularly Eagle Splendor. Avoid using the Friends cantrip though, as you'll cast it on Lazel, not Voss costing you 10 approval points with Lazelle, and not even helping with the deception check. And if you do fail the deception check, well, now's a good time to call them ogres. Another spot that gives people trouble is the fight against the so-called Paladins of Tear. Anders in particular. It's always a good idea to wait until at least level 4 before attempting this fight, but if you have a wizard or a sorcerer with magic missile, Anders is surprisingly easy to beat. And with either or both of these items, it'll work even better. First, hide your party back here and send your missiler up onto the top level. Then destroy the ladder behind you, as well as the other one inside the room. Head back out and position yourself right here, where the board on the wall and the board on the ground line up. Then just cast Magic Missile on Anders. He actually can jump high enough to reach you up here, but if you're hidden around the corner like this, he won't do it. This spot causes all three of the paladins to bug out trying to reach you, allowing you to safely missile away until Anders is dead. You can use his portrait to target him through the wall. After that, just send in the rest of your sneaky party to clean up the other two. And while you're here, don't forget to go down into the basement, sit on some chairs, disarm this pressure plate, or just jump over it, and pick up some decent items. In the goblin camp, you can thin out their numbers a bit by poisoning their booze supply. Be aware that you'll need to do some smooth talking or smooth handing to get away with it. And afterward, Grat will stop acting as a vendor, so make sure you buy any items you want from him before you do it. Speaking of him, vendors drop a few of their most valuable items when they die. So, if there's a vendor that you know is going to have an unfortunate accident later, sell him your most expensive goods now, then snatch those treasures back after he's dead and sell them to someone else. After all, turnabout is fair play, Grat. Nicked him off the dead, didn't I? There are multiple useful items that only work if you've got the brand of the Absolute, and there's nothing stopping you from getting everyone in the party branded. Just get the brand on one character, Leave the conversation before telling Priest's gut that you need a healer. Switch to the next party member and do it again. 
Once Gut has served her purpose, it's time to take her out. Just put the group into stealth on one side of her. Then move a party member to the opposite side to attack, so that she turns away from the rest of the party without seeing them. Then just knock her lights out. You really don't want her to call her friends, so if you're not confident that you have the firepower to put her down in one turn, the silence spell comes back into play. It not only stops her from casting any spells, but also prevents her from yelling for help. This gives you all the time in the world to finish her off. As long as she doesn't interrupt your concentration. If you crouch right here next to Minthara, neither she nor her underling will see you, giving you a good opening spot for melee, with the ranged characters chilling out over here. Oh yeah, and don't miss this nifty ring hiding in the skeleton near the door down to the ward pens. Once you've got Koga's naughty letter, you're ready to deal with the Shadow Druids. It's not exactly a tough battle, but you can skip fighting them entirely by running them off while they're still in rat form. Use various non-direct attacks like Arrow of Darkness, Sleep, or even Alchemist Fire as long as you're careful not to hit Koga with it. When you speak to her, the cutscene will still show the rats transforming, but once the conversation is over, they'll be gone whether you talk Korga out of fighting or not. Let's go take on the Spider Matriarch. Remember those boots you looted earlier? Time to put them to work. First, you want to destroy all of the eggs. These ones down here are easy, but the ones up there require patience. Wait for the boss to move to the other side of the web, then pop just one or two before moving back and waiting again. Don't get impatient. Once those two piles of eggs are gone, there's just one left. How to take them out? One alchemist fire will do the trick. You can throw it from all the way over here, and nothing will aggro. From downtown! You can even pick off one of the smaller spiders by using ranged attacks from here, then running away to leave the fight. After all that, the boss is a lot easier to take out the old-fashioned way. Keep in mind that the boss has to be in line of sight for her legendary action to hit you. And, like every other honor boss, if she's prone, her legendary action won't trigger. That not easy enough? Okay, fine. If you've got a rogue and a lot of patience, there's another way. After popping the first two piles of eggs, Leave the last pile on the lower level alone. Equip the web boots and use a ranged attack from here to start the fight. Go into stealth, then move around into this corner so that the boss won't see you when it spins around. End your turn and watch as the silliness begins. The matriarch will hatch the eggs, but then just sit there. When it's your turn again, Take your one shot at the boss, go back into stealth, in turn, and repeat. All of the spiders will sit around looking confused as you slowly pick away at the boss, but none of them will ever move or attack you. It's going to take a while, so let me use this chance to say that if you learned something new from this video, I'd appreciate it if you drop a like and leave a comment about which tip you found most helpful, and if you don't learn something new, I'd appreciate it if you drop a dislike and leave a comment about how I wasted your time. But there's still some video left to go, so don't give up yet. Okay, I think Astarian's almost done. Last notes on this method. You can also use a Gloomstalker Ranger or Shadow Monk, or even anyone with an offhand crossbow. And if the boss gets stuck and doesn't even try to hatch the eggs, well, just get into a good position and plug away. As long as you always end your turn in stealth, you'll be fine. Need some inspiration points on demand? If you have Gale or another sage in the party, you can just carry the various books around with you and wait to read them until you're low on points. Time to deal with the hag, for which I'd strongly advise you to wait until you have both Volo's Eye and at least level 5. You can surprise attack all four red caps right here, right now, so they won't run up behind you later if you get on Ethel's bad side. Stop. Please. Shut up. Please. Ah. 
Sure, you can always toss items on top of the vents to block the poison gas, but that takes too long. Instead, just cast Featherfall on the party and jump down from here. Once you're safely past the traps, sneak the whole party around the side and into Ethel's back room. From here, you can even leave out the back way and go to camp to rest if you need to. Since the hag is fey, protection from evil and good is very useful against her. Use scrolls if you got them, as well as this neck piece that's conveniently sitting right here. When you're ready to start the fight, sneak your party out into the main room with melee on the far side. Once again, we're going to make use of silence. No, not on her, as tempting as it is. Stand far back here and cast Silence right in this spot, on top of where the hag is hiding. Then, go back into stealth and hop over here to get in position to reveal Ethel and free Marina, so you won't have to worry about her burning. Move the Silencer out of harm's way and get melee into position to get the drop on the hag. From there, you can pile damage onto her. The silence stops her from spawning clones, from turning into Mayrina, and even from going into her surrender cutscene, so you'll actually need to cancel the concentration once you get her health low enough. Unlike Prone, silence will not stop her legendary action from triggering. If you do need to cast a spell, always use a cantrip first, since it will only spawn a single clone. Then, you can use Magic Missile to easily clean up the remaining clones. If you don't have Silence on hand, or even if you do, really, you can also try using Drow Poison on the hag, since she's not immune. If she fails her save, be sure to go into turn-based mode so the sleep doesn't wear off. Then, you can get an easy free crit on her and go to town. That didn't take long. And if she does make her save against the poison, well, at least you can check her buffs to see which one is real. Anytime you're dealing with Dwegar, or anyone else that likes to turn invisible, you can use ping on their portrait to locate them and then attack the spot where they're standing. Before starting the conversation with Philomene, keep someone in stealth out of range. Then, when you start talking to her, switch to that other party member, sneak in, and snatch that full barrel of rune powder from right under her nose. You can even still talk her into giving you the vial, too. The rune powder barrel is worth a huge amount of gold. So once again, you should sell it to someone that you know is going to bite the dust soon, then pick it back up later. To make the fight against Nier a bit easier, just give him a thoughtful gift while he's standing around talking. He can still use his legendary action, but he's pretty unimpressive without his spells. And if you'd rather deal with him alone, why not just start by taking out the entire crew of Dwegar before you even break down the rubble? You can use Arrow of Ilmater or Bone Chill to stop the Lava Elemental from healing. Take me there, and thou shalt bathe in her golden gifts. Uh, no thanks. There are probably more videos about cheesing the Grim fight than anything else, so most already know tricks like shooting it from above or dropping a 5,000 kilo owlbear on its head. Personally, I've always preferred to just use the hammer. Nope, not that kind of hammer. This kind of hammer. Or better yet, a monk who can do tremendous amounts of bludgeoning damage. How do you deal with the legendary action? With our old friend, Silence. Anyone standing inside will be immune to thunder damage. Just be sure you stand in a spot where the knockback won't put you into the lava. With the rest of the party out of range of Grimm's stomps, they can toss potions to keep the monk alive. Make sure someone has the Hell Rider's Pride gloves on if you're going to try this. Of course, you can gain the same damage reduction by using a Barbarian, at the loss of the higher damage and ability to knock Grim prone. 
After you've taken care of the Dwegar intruders for Sovereign Spa, this method works well. Don't turn in the quest too hastily. The Bliss Spores buff you get from reporting to Sovereign Spa is very powerful, giving you plus 1d6 to all attack rolls, skill checks, and even saving throws. So, you want to make sure that you've long rested first and that you have somewhere to go with lots of good opportunities to make use of the buff. I know a place like that. It's called Kresh Yillik. There are all sorts of skill checks, saving throws, and attack rolls to make while you're there. The buff also gives you a good opportunity to read that spooky book you've been carrying around. Once you get to the Inquisitor's Chamber, don't be too quick to talk to him just yet. You can walk into both of the side rooms to steal all of the treasure, as long as you're sneaky about it. This includes going for the blood of Lathander. Having trouble turning that statue? A little grease will loosen it right up. To deal with these traps, leave the rest of the party behind and stand right here. In this spot, even if you fail the disarm, you won't get hit by the knockback. And do the same thing again here. If you're not confident in your positioning, you can also use the Boots of Striding that you looted from Minthara. Just cast any concentration spell, and the push from the trap won't actually knock you away. If you want to take on the Inquisitor the normal way, then start the conversation as usual and take a trip inside the artifact. But before you leave, go into turn-based mode, then click the portal. This will give you the chance to position your party and to make the first move. A good first move to make is casting the Grease spell. The Inquisitor actually has mediocre dexterity saves, and his legendary resistance doesn't activate when saving against this spell. And, like everyone else, while he's prone, his legendary action won't trigger. As long as you cast Grease in a good position, your melee characters can walk right up and give him the business. Want to try something a little less normal? If so, then don't talk to the Inquisitor at all. Instead, move the party all the way out here and tuck them completely into the corner. Then send in someone with at least 20 strength, which Elixir of Hill Giant Strength will cover nicely. Remember those skeletons back in the crypt? Well... They're not the only guys you can carry around as an improvised weapon. Just as before, be careful to cancel action before you actually reach the spot you clicked. Unlike the skeletons, the Inquisitor won't politely stay where you put him down. So, you can use turn-based mode to pause and pick him up again for another trip. While in turn-based mode, you'll be limited to your usual move distance, so move almost as far as you can, cancel action to put him down, then backtrack just a little to give you time to grab him again before he gets too far past you. But you can keep trying as long as you don't actually complete the action and toss him away. I mean, we are going to toss him, just not until we get him right here. Aim right at the very bottom corner of this rock, where the cursor says death. Then give him the heave-ho. Quickly move the thrower into position with the rest of the party and put everyone into stealth. Why? because here come some friends. As long as you're all the way in the corner, they won't see you as they run in. Once they've all stopped moving, you can easily ambush them from behind. After you've dealt with them, head back into the Inquisitor's Chamber, surprise these guys too, and the Vlacketh conversation will trigger as soon as you kill the last one. She even compliments you for your work. Inquisitor Wawargaz was potent. We are impressed! And that's all for now. I focused on Act 1 for this video because the majority of the problem spots I heard people mention were all early in the game. But if you'd like to see another video like this for Act 2 or 3, please let me know in the comments. And if you do want to see more videos, it seems logical to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss them. Thank you very much for watching. Besides, tastes like pork.